Um, well, it's been a great morning, hasn't it? I've had lots of really awesome feedback from everyone, and I'm really pleased that you're having such a great time. Um, we've had some fantastic speakers this morning. Um, we had to, as you know, reshuffle today a little bit, and uh, as a result, uh, we're now getting two keynotes, so that's, that's really fantastic. Um, I think the next speaker probably needs no introduction. Everyone's going to know... Um, who he is and what he stands for straight away. And that's a fantastic um, recognition of the amount of effort that he's put into the campaigns and the issues that are important um, to him. Um, Senator Scott Ludlam uh, is well known for um, campaigning not only on the kind of key environmental issues that the Greens are well known for, but also a range of communications and technology issues that are um, really, I think, quite close to the hearts of a lot of people uh, involved in the open source community and the Drupal community and the public sector. Um, so I'm really pleased to welcome uh, the Senator for Western Australia, Mr Scott Ludlam. Thanks for that lovely intro. Isn't it great that you can fill an auditorium in the nation's capital with people it's a bit of a testament to the strength of this community, I think. You could get so many people to an event like this. It's lovely to see you. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for the invite. And while I might uh, at the outset apologise for all the schedule shuffling that's had us at midday, I also want to thank you profoundly and from the bottom of my heart for getting me out of estimates committees. It's, <laughs> it's such a delight to be here. <laughs> you might be stuck with me for the rest of the day. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the ground on which we stand, the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, um, who have been stewards of this uh, part of the world for tens of thousands of years. Um, Al Boyd, who some of you probably know, who's here today, I can't see him, he's in the audience, reminded me last night that the first Drupal site that the Australian Greens put up was, uh, was a work choices campaigning site, I think built on Drupal 4.5, and so, uh, we obviously can take a large measure of credit in this community. Developers can take a large measure of credit uh, for the Drupal platform for bringing an end to the vicious work choices regime. <laughs> and, um, but it did remind us that, that, so that was like 11 years ago, 10 or 11 years ago, that um, that, that site got built. It was actually really valuable for us and for me. Um, I think the reason that Bob gave me the communications portfolio after I got elected in 2007 was uh, it wasn't his favourite kind of most passionate portfolio, um, but that also I'd been a web developer sort of in the mid-1990s when it was first a thing. Uh, and to be able to sort of handwrite HTML code and stick it up in the air and then show other people your stuff, even if they're on the other side of the world, um, I don't think that's worn off, actually. Um, that's still something that's kind of exciting. And we never looked back, actually. We've been using Drupal and the Australian Greens for successive builds and rebuilds of our main election campaign site, our main party sites and other subsidiary sites since then, since 10, 11 years ago. We certainly haven't looked back. So I want to say really, what are you getting ready now for the installation or the, the rollout of Drupal 8? So lots of water under the bridge. But I um, want to take this opportunity to say thank you because our organisation benefited, our campaigns have benefited, the things that we want to communicate with people have certainly benefited from um, from your work, from the global community that make um, products and projects like Drupal so robust. So thanks for doing what you do, because it helps us do what we're trying to do. Um, and so that, that was quite a while ago now. About six years ago, our organisation was then in a position to retain the services of some of the people in this room today um, to keep contributing um, to the work that, that we do. The open source ethos obviously is one that sits very comfortably amongst the uh, Greens politics and our broader suite of communications portfolios and the power of a community of open-minded and dedicated or like-minded and dedicated developers to put the best tools available into the hands of anyone who wants them is a philosophy a long way removed from the headline grabbing greed that sometimes dominates contemporary commentary about the tech sector and this really this community and its values and then the products that it brings forward really run quite um, strongly counter to that ethos. Um, and it's, so it's great to see that this community in particular has made such powerful inroads into government. I was looking um, over the last couple of days sort of thinking about what would be useful to 
to bring up here, at some of the commentary in the US, uh, you wouldn't be too strong to call it despair, about how open source, not just Drupal platforms, but op open source ethos in general, how hard they're finding it to crack into the federal government over there because the, co the ethos is much more strongly that you're going to pin it on one single uh, vendor peddling enterprise software. It's one ask to kick. It's one contract to sign. There's, you, you know, you're not going to get mail from people trying to debug your software for you. And I, at that point, I kind of realized, well, what has happened here is that you've sort of taken advantage of that crack in the door. You've gone all the way through, and I think it's proved it's an immensely valuable case study for other people trying to get uh, the open software or more broadly the free software movement into the higher echelons of government is to point at precisely what's happening here. Uh, and it's not, obviously, you haven't been successful with, uh, with DrupalGov through just the ethos, but because the product is better, the product is materially better. And so uh, I think that's actually quite a powerful thing that's opened the door. Um, it makes the work of open government advocates easier uh, right across the spectrum, not just if you're doing specific development work for federal government agencies, but those who are trying to run the broader agenda of the open gov movement. Open, uh, once government adopts open source projects, once any organisation does, the beauty of the many contributors model and the wisdom of the crowd becomes evident, and that can't help but change the way that the organisation does work. We've been, um, I've actually been quite impressed by the way that the uh, Digital Transformation Office has got up on its feet with some of the hires that they've made, some of the issues that it's prioritising, um, and some of the agencies that it's kind of gone to work on first. I don't know if there's anybody here from the DTO, but it appears um, to me that we're off to a reasonably good start. So yes, we're a couple of years behind some other jurisdictions, but there appear to be some pretty bright people right in the middle of that. And the fact that it's been picked up and moved with uh, Malcolm Turnbull into PMNC, I think is also quite positive. It is precisely the kind of initiative that you'd want to see uh, within the Prime Minister's department as it's meant to sort of branch out and impact all quarters of the government. Um, the progress is obviously very uneven, um, but at least it's started. And my pitch really, I think there are two frontiers to break down if we're actually going to see real progress. The first one is Treasury. Um, they've had a project going for a little while um, called Open Economy, which uh, would try to bring these principles to bear on the budget process. Like, that's your tax money. Um, how much are they taking off you and then what are they doing with it? Where does it actually go? So it's monumentally difficult to track. The first iteration, um, which was something that we were doing alongside some folks from um, GovHack a couple of years ago, uh, we ended up making a contribution because they were spending all night um, copying and pasting material from PDF files into spreadsheets and then scrubbing it and sticking it online so that people could actually make a map of the federal budget. I think we've maybe moved beyond that, but different departments still have very, very different protocols and formats in place for financial records, and that, to me, feels like a really interesting frontier to try and breach. The second one, obviously, are the national security agencies, uh, and this is something that I've had a fair amount uh, to do with, and I think the open gov movement at some point is going to run directly head on into the closed gov movement, uh, of those who would actually rather keep things profoundly opaque and outside the purview, not merely of the public, but the parliament itself. So best of luck with that. Um, I also spent quite a bit of uh, time working on the National Broadband Network, and I know it's slightly tangential, I guess, to the stuff that you'll be discussing today. The only, the only comfort I take, I suppose, from the way that the NBN uh, project has been profoundly sabotaged and crashed is that if there's going to be ubiquitous millisecond scale real-time real surveillance of the entire population, at least it's going to be incredibly slow. Um, <laughs> I can't think of any other bright side. I'm happy to take some on if, if anybody's thought of anything in the Q&A. Um, and that really is what I suppose some of the, like supporting the NBN, supporting the DTO, supporting some of the other really good stuff that's going on, good people in good heart, working inside the machine, either at the political layer, the bureaucratic layer, the contractor layer. Um, we're happy to support that kind of stuff, but it's not particularly glamorous, and you, you probably won't see us bobbing up on TV saying, hey, actually, the DTO appears to be doing some quite good stuff. The stuff that does get the profile, and I suppose one of the reasons that people 
vote for people like me to get into the position where we're able to do the sort of stuff that we do, is that the medium itself is under threat, not just here, obviously, but globally. The internet was a creation of the military-industrial complex. It, you know, it was built post the Second World War by, uh, by research departments from within inside the United States Department of Defense who wanted to communicate with each other uh, in a way that would, you all know this story, in a way that would, you know, still be able to perpetuate if a particular site got taken out in a nuclear war. Cheerful thought. So the military industrial complex built the medium um, and it appears that it wants it back, actually. The, the medium itself is being militarized and recolonized by some of those very same agencies whose ancestors built the, the initial um, framework. And I suspect, and I wouldn't want to overgeneralize, that one of the things that would have brought you into this room Hopefully, it was the opportunity to make a living doing, doing the kind of stuff you love. But I also suspect if we took a poll and we can a bit later, you're also here partly because you love the medium, like the potential of it, the power of it. The any to anyone to anyone communications medium so different to the broadcast one to many, just going to yell at you from a podium model that most of us would have been familiar with. That, that's the power of the medium. It's barely even been realised, and that it's those precise values that are under so much threat at the moment. Um, seeing the reignition of the crypto wars that some of you probably went through in the 1990s, maybe we should ban strong encryption because terrorists will use it. Uh, and also, unfortunately, that the global financial system uses it. Journalists use it. Whistleblowers use strong encryption. We all have a stake in making sure that if these conversations reignite here in Australia in the way that they are in the UK and the US, that it's based on evidence, not on some of the kind of knee-jerk responses that we've seen, particularly in the UK, that um, the fundamental human right to privacy uh, and the debt that we owe to those uh, pioneers who wrote the protocols that still provide strong protections for privacy um, all these many years later, those values are again under threat. And they're under threat, unfortunately, by the government that's, got, that's had some good contributions in other areas. You might be aware, you might not be aware, that the department or the unit within the Attorney General's department that has presided over the extraordinarily shambolic debacle of the data retention um, laws being implemented against the will of the tech community that's having to do it, just gave themselves an award. Can we just have a round of applause, please, for the Attorney General's Department? <laughs> Thanks for indulging that. So um, I probably don't have a great deal more to put to you this morning. Those are a couple of top line thoughts before we dive back into the estimates process. And I don't think I've got the sign to get off the stage yet. So I wanted to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. Sorry if this has ranged a little bit more broadly than uh, developing awesome websites for the federal government. But thanks for everything that you do. We certainly appreciate it. We use your work every day, and it's profoundly appreciated. Thanks for the invite today. We uh, don't have a roving mic. Is, does it, would anyone um, have a question about anything that Scott's uh, spoken about? Or stuff I haven't spoken about. You can ask me about nuclear waste if you want. I'm working on that at the moment. <laughs> it's right up the back corner. Yeah. Oh, look, they, sh they shouldn't let arrests and the threat of incarceration for the rest of their lives, um, you know, take the edge off the argument. I don't, think, I don't think it's lost. I think these are absolutely live issues. I don't think we have the luxury to, to say that we lost. Um, if, if these tools weren't robust and if we had lost, they would never have got Edward Snowden out of that hotel room in Hong Kong. You know, if it wasn't actually possible to protect your privacy, despite being hit by the most powerful and technically sophisticated adversaries that there are in the world, it's actually still possible, if you really know what you're doing, to protect yourself and protect your privacy and your work against those adversaries. Now, it may be that he needs to spend the next 20 years effectively in exile in Moscow, but if those tools weren't strong, so, I mean, it's not just the tools, obviously, it's the fact that you had people who really knew what they were doing and knew how to use them, um, that have never that have never got him out of there. So no, all is not lost. Um, and maybe this is a very narrow interpretation of what was a fairly broad question. But the very fact that uh, the response to Cameron, to Prime Minister Cameron's interventions on strong cryptography in the UK, were howled down like they were just dumped upon 
by the technical community there, which has got reasonably good reach. Um, and I think that argument's yet to be had here in Australia. So no, all is, if, if all was lost, I probably wouldn't be wasting your time. I, I probably, I'm not sure what I'd be doing, but I wouldn't be up here. I thought there was another hand. We could just like meditate for 10 minutes as well. <laughs> I'm totally up for a bit of peace. Um, I've got a question for you. Go on. Um, so in our, in our earlier uh, discussions, we heard uh, about the role of, um, of innovation in Congo. Um, uh, what, um, what place do you see for uh, small business or um, innovation within government agencies for solving some of these challenges that we've discussed? Oh, I think it's a very good conversation to be engaged in. I mean, small business, it's probably a bit of an oversimplification, but I think there's a reason why people point to small business as the site of innovation uh, and as the place that you look to, I'm, without wanting to play Turnbull buzzword bingo, the place that you look to for agility, the place that you look to for fresh ideas, stuff coming up. And it's partly because, yes, there's people there who are willing to take risks or who aren't constrained by institutional structures uh, or what you know the way that things might have been worth uh, working in the past, but also that the failure rate is is quite high um, at the small business layer, and it's really only the successes that we hear about within government departments. I think the open gov movement can play a really important role, and again, you can see signs of fresh thinking branching out. But traditionally, government departments are not where you look to for for innovation. Um, at all. In fact, it's where you look to for innovations to be squashed or just have the life squeezed out of them. Um, and again, that's an oversimplification and apologies if I've offended anybody in here, but um, I, it wearies me a little bit. I think the talk is good, the talk is positive, and it's certainly better to have a Prime Minister who at least has more than passing understanding of the medium and of the space than someone who kind of hated technology and wanted it all to stop. Um, <laughs> like that, yeah, cue uneasy laughter. It's funny now in retrospect, but we've just come out of a period of sort of scorched earth politics around communications policy. I think it's good to have somebody at the helm who's technically literate, but it's also the same guy who introduced the data retention bill and smashed up the NBN. So now we're stuck with, there's still copper going out to greenfield estates uh, on the far edges of our cities, and we're going to be stuck with these nodes on every street corner for God knows how long. So the talk is good. I think some of the language is encouraging. It's the innovation stuff, you can't help but be encouraged by it. But how that it hits the ground is a, um, you know, a real-time surveillance system is being built, and that one had Malcolm Turnbull's handwriting on the bill. And uh, we're building an NBN that's going to be obsolete on the day they start switching it on. That doesn't sound very innovative. There's other words for that. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there is, but it's just going to take twice as long as it should have. And at, at the moment, um, the politics is kind of messed up because they got a bit of a free pass. And a little bit later this week, I think tomorrow, we'll have a chance to talk to the ABC in estimates about what they did to Nick Ross. Uh, they're pretty serious allegations that deserve to be tested. Because if the ABC can't be relied on to report even-handedly you know, we've got a model that's going to be expensive, it's going to be slow, it's going to be risky, but it's going to be future-proof. Once the hardware's installed, you'll be, you can see the upgrade path for the next 50, 60 years. Or you can have a proposal that will also be expensive, risky, take a long time to build, and it's going to be buggered on the day you light it up. Uh, and that reporting wasn't really getting out. So I think it is fixable. It's just that we... It depends partly on whether there's a change of government. Um, the Labor Party who I'm happy to give credit to. I think Stephen Conroy's model was the right one. I think some of the implementation and the giant pyramid of contractors and subcontractors and subcontractors, in, in some cases, was six layers deep before you got to the people who were actually laying the cable and all these people in the middle sucking cash out and slowing things down. Um, but the model, the market structure, and as far as I was concerned, the engineering, was the right model. And so that's still there. You know, The model we can still go back to. Um, but it's going to be much more costly than it should have been. It's going to take a lot longer than it should have done. But we can't afford to give up. It feels like we're just now watching the different states and territories roll out railways of different gauges. You kind of see where this is going. I mean, goodness, Australia would never do something like that, would we? <laughs> should we do one more and I'll let you go? I, should, I feel like this is just a giant distraction from work. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I should let you get back to work. Yeah. Um, in a, in a, 
general sense that a company like Yapra doesn't know that. I think the example of people was that maybe maybe you're a manual you should really just be providing like raw data so that other providers can do things like the weather forecast and things like that. Or your own sorts of things. I don't like it. <laughs> I hope I haven't offended the keynote speaker. Uh, I, look, I think there's something to be said for by all means dump it into the into the public domain, like throw it out there in a place where people can find it and mash it up and play with it. I think it's a wonderful idea, but not if that's just being as an, used as an excuse to wind down. Uh, you know, BOM isn't just a data collecting organisation. There's a huge amount of institutional memory and expertise there about climate and how to interpret the numbers. Um, so no, I would not necessarily want to see that get outsourced. Hope I haven't upset anybody. By all means, do it. Throw it out there. Let people play with it and run a mark. Um, we'd find that quite useful. But they they do more. They, they they do a lot more, as far as I'm concerned, than just collect data. Maybe that's just me being a bit old-fashioned. I like the bureau. I think they should stay. <laughs> All right. One more quick one. Otherwise, I'm going to boot off and let you get back to what you actually came here to do. Okay. I'll be back. It looks probably pretty easy to say no they, no, they don't. Uh, I think there's a fear of picking winners. Like, you've probably all heard that, right? Like, it's not the state's role to get involved in these really fine-grained commercial decisions, so we shouldn't pick winners. Um, what that unfortunately means is that big industrial incumbents, particularly mining banks, um, big engineering companies, are on this, you know, extraordinary subsidy pipeline and drip feed that just flows through in a torrent. Property industry is another one. And that that's not considered picking winners. You can drop gargantuan subsidies on, on these really powerful incumbent sectors and then that's not part of the subsidies story. But as soon as you look at uh, actual innovation funding for people who might want to try something new, that's considered picking winners and being a bit dangerous. So seeing that play out, two sectors that, um, that I kind of think of as being useful illustrations, one is the clean energy sector where we actually had an institutional structure and we've still got the best bits of it left. It was funded by the carbon price, the revenue stream is gone. But ARENA, which is there to basically encourage the startup culture in the clean tech sector, and then the CEFC, which is there to take the ones to the bank that are ready for bridging finance or de-risking or, or actually taking to the market. That was, that was Christine Milne, and I think that's a really good model. Uh, it was a good model before the, the uh, government cut the guts out of the ARENA funding. But you can still see there, it's like this two-step pipeline. We've got people in CSIRO doing pure research. You've got people being funded by ARENA to take good ideas to the prototype stage. And then you've got the CEFC to take the, to take the good prototypes to the market. And there'd be failures and dropouts and stuff along the way, but at least you can see the pipeline. Um, and the government still have bills on the books and it is their intention, as far as they tell us, to wipe that institutional structure out and just let the market decide by which they mean presumably more coal and gas. The other one that I'm increasingly fond of uh, is, is the gaming sector, which is maybe a little bit closer to the hearts of folk in here, where you've got precisely the kind of nimble, agile, innovative, somebody yell bingo and I'll stop, uh, uh, entities out there trying to do remarkably creative things for a global audience and a market literally of billions with a B. Uh, Simon Crean organised a tiny little $20 million rolling fund, which made a huge and very positive difference uh, in that sector and, and actually saw a real flowering of, of creative genius. Uh, and then Brandis killed it after 12 months, said, no, we're not doing that anymore. 20 million bucks. And at the end of the three-year cycle, there'd still be $20 million in there. It wasn't handouts. They were basically loans to, to people to get, to get moving on promising projects. Now, there's a sector that ticks actually all of the buzzword boxes that gets no institutional support whatsoever. So, I've forgotten what the question was, but I've certainly, <laughs> I've really enjoyed the rant. Thank you so much for your time and good luck for the rest of the day.